السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان دا نیم آف اللہ دا مرسی فون مرسی فو اینڈ موسٹ بینیفیشنٹ سی آئی سیک ریفیوج فرام دا لارڈ آف مین دا کنگ آف مین دا گاڈ آف مین فرام دا مسچف آف دا سلنکنگ پرامٹر ہو وسپس ان دا ہارٹس آف مین فرام امنگ جن اینڈ مین ان دا سورا Refuge is sought in the Lord, sovereign and God of mankind from the insidious whisperer, jinn or human who prompts evil ideas into people's minds. The surah presents the relevant attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep away this invisible evil which the mind on its own cannot shut out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the merciful, instructs his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his followers to recognize these attributes of his and seek his protection against the sneaking evil which locates itself within their hearts for they cannot rid themselves of such evil which creeps into their hearts without the aid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This sneaking whisperer operates secretly. We also realize that it is jinn as well as human. For human beings are not exceptions in spreading evil while unseen. We do not know how the jinn performs this whispering but we certainly find its repercussions in the behavior of individuals as well, in, as well as in human life generally. But significantly, man has not been left alone, but given the necessary means of protection by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has been provided with the power of faith or iman, that is conscious belief in and knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through conviction and sincere devotion. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anha related that Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Satan besieges the individual's heart. He subsides when whenever one consciously remembers Allah but insinuates his evil whenever one is unthoughtful of him. As for humans, we know a great deal of their curious ways of whispering and prompting and sometimes are more devilish than the devil. Example, a ruler's advisor who whispers to him and turns him into a tyrant. A slanderer who fabricates and decorates tales to make them sound convincing. A hustler of immoral business dealings who exploits people's sensual and unhealthy desires. A bad companion who injects evil into his companion's heart and mind while he is unaware as he is thought to be trustworthy. A hundred other whisperers who lay various traps inconspicuously utilizing people's different weak points. They are more devilish than even the jinn themselves. Faced with evil in this guise, man is not capable of ensuring his own safety. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore points out to him in this surah the means he can employ in this fierce battle. The battle is everlasting since the prompter is always watchful for the right moment. That is, when one neglects the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the believer to be conscious of Allah once in a while is not sufficient as the war is continuous till the end of time. Remember the promise Satan made to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala till resurrection day. This concept of the battle and the source of evil in it, whether provoked by Satan or his human ag agent, fully inspired man to feel that he is not helpless in it, since his Lord 
controls all creations and events. Though he has permitted Satan to attack, he has also provided guidance to man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves Satan only to those who neglect him, their Lord, sovereign and deity. But those who live in consciousness of him are safe and protected. Praise be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the beginning and at the end. From him we derive confidence and success. To him we return for unfailing support. Welcome to Health Matters. Today in, at, in our studio we have a guest, Dr. Abu Bakr Sayyid, who is a practicing podiatrist and he has been in practice for 12 years. Dr. Sayyid comes with a lot of experience. He, has, uh, he is a local graduate. He has graduated at the University of Johannesburg, but he has also been to the UK where he has practiced and gained more experience and is currently practicing in Johannesburg. I'm going to hand over to Dr. Sayed. Welcome, Dr. Sayed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and jazakallah for that introduction. Uh, Dr. Sayed, what can you tell us about podiatry? We know that people talk a lot about podiatry, but perhaps you can explain to the viewers out there more about what podiatry is all about. Gee, podiatrist is, uh, what a podiatrist is, we specialist who looks after the foot, lower limbs and ankle, so we can examine, diagnose any conditions which affect these parts. A podiatrist deals with patients from as young as two years old, right up until the elderly patients, including sports patients and a whole vast of patients. So you see a whole, a whole range of uh, uh, conditions uh, with in relation to podiatry, but you've also identified quite a wide range of age uh, of the patients that are presented to your practice. Gee, indeed, as I said, I mean, we see a condition starting from your basic skin conditions or your common skin conditions, which will be presented to a podiatrist, going on to your muscular injuries, going on to the orthopedic side of it, uh, injuries, and also abnormalities. So podiatrists deal with a host of conditions and also, as I said, with a big, vast age group. Now, you have indicated that your area of expertise is pediatric podiatry. Can you elaborate a little bit more on pediatric podiatry? Yeah. Um, firstly, I enjoy working with kids and that's why I sort of choose it more as an expertise. And also, I see a lot of pediatric patients uh, patients starting with conditions and a lot of parents would bring them there initially concerned about how the child is walking, they're not walking correctly, or sometimes the child is born with the extra digit or toes. So we look at these type of conditions and we assess patients from about the age of two and a half years old where we advise the parents with regard to flat feet, high arch foot, whether the child walks inwards, uh, bow legs, knock knees. So these are the various conditions besides the dermatological conditions that are presented to us daily in practice. So you talk about high arches, flat feet. Can you actually explain to us, you know, um, what, what does that actually mean, a flat foot or a, a high arch uh, if, uh, if a little child is presented to you? What do parents actually need to look out for? And, and children that walk with their uh, feet towards each other, what do you call that condition? Okay, first let's start off with flat feet. Uh, flat feet. If we look on the screen, we'll be able to see the picture of the flat foot. Flat foot is when the arch is actually collapsed or is flat, and this can be because the foot is inward tilted, and they're putting a more pressure, lots of pressure, on the medial side or the inside of the foot. A high arch, as we can see on the screen, a high arch, uh, or we can't see it on the screen, the high arch foot is when it's much higher than that, and we'll be able to assist also in that way. So flat feet basically is when the foot collapses and how a podiatrist would help is by using these arch supports. And these arch supports will lift up the foot and inshallah also with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prevent the foot from going further and deteriorating. 
So what are the symptoms? If a person presents with a flat foot, what are the symptoms that would be manifested or experienced by the patient? Again, flat feet can be symptomatic or asymptomatic, meaning someone can experience pain or does not experience pain. But commonly, we see patients uh, who do experience pain uh, would come complaining of foot pain, leg pain, uh, pain in the heel area, um, pain going up to the knees. In fact, pain going up to the right, up to the, the lower back itself. And that's when we as podiatrists successfully try and treat these patients because sometimes we'd get patients would be referred from other uh, medical professionals for chronic lower leg pain or chronic uh, back pain. And as podiatrists, that's how we will be able to assist them with their flat feet. Uh, and then with the high arches, the extremely high arches, what, what is it that uh, a podiatrist would do for that uh, patient? Again, a high arched foot would actually change the way the patient is walking. And by changing the way the patient is walking, he'd be able to strain his muscles more. And again, this will cause pain on the various uh, sectors. For example, with high arch foot, you get more knee pain and lower back pain. And there as well, a podiatrist can intervene by making devices which can fit inside the shoes, etc. And this will be able to assist them in walking better. Okay, so you, we also, you, you know, we, I, mean, I asked you the question of children. You mentioned about them walking with their feet to curling towards each other. Uh, what is that condition called? Commonly referred to as pigeon toes or intoing gait. Intoing gait is where the child would walk inwards and perhaps trip over their feet. Sometimes parents would see it as the child being clumsy and say, my child always trips, trips over, he's very clumsy, etc. And perhaps it'd be referred by a pediatrician to say, go and see a podiatrist because there might be a problem in the way your child is walking. That's why he's tripping over. And parents are really shocked when you come to them and you ask them this question. He says, yes. Unfortunately, I feel so guilty. I always thought my child was clumsy. But actually, the child has a problem with the way he or she is walking. And that's where a podiatrist, who we can intervene by advising them uh, different stretching exercises, by giving different techniques or, of shoe wear, advising them different types of shoe wear that they can wear, or even building up devices like inner sole or orthotic devices which can be worn inside the shoes. And this will then correct the child from walking inwards and perhaps now make them walk more straightwards. Dr. Sayed, I, I, I think you mentioned something about children and, and uh, correct, uh, wearing correct shoes. Do you think ill fit, I mean, uh, is it that the shoes children are wearing today and people in general are wearing today contribute to, uh, to a lot of the problems that are being presented in practice? Definitely a lot of pathologies are seen because of tight-fitting shoe wear or ill-fitting uh, footwear. A lot of the shoes that we have today uh, in South Africa, we get it from the European last, meaning the shape of the shoe. So the shape of the shoe is really tight-fitting and you find nowadays a fashion, if we're talking about uh, ladies, which we'll perhaps touch on to later on into the show, they're wearing very tight or narrow pointing fitted shoes. Even the men fashion is going towards it. They call it the BE type footwear. So this as well is causing a lot of pressure and because of a lot of pressure it leads to different type of conditions which appears in the foot. Going back to the pediatric patient, uh, footwear is very important, uh, especially in development. Initially we advise barefoot walking because barefoot walking allows a smaller intrinsic muscle to develop properly, allows the foot to grow properly. And we find at times parents these days are very fashion conscious and want the children to wear a heavy type of boots or very tight fitting shoe wear when actually this is what causes more problems. Sometimes even because of incorrect footwear you'd find the child trips over easily and uh, unfortunately it still happens but hand downs. Hand downs are not a good thing because once a child has worn the shoe it's taken to that shape etc. So you mentioned about being a slave to fashion and that parents all follow the trends, the fashionable trends and of course uh, and uh, allowing children to wear these kind of shoes. So children wearing heels, shoes with heels, we find that little girls as young as three, four, five year olds also wearing uh, small heels or you know, the, the, the so-called high heel shoes. Uh, what, what is your take on that? What? Definitely it's a no-go and we advise parents perhaps not to become victims of fashion and not to allow the children to wear these high um, 
fashionable shoes because what it does it actually changes the way the child walks if you just look at the hand the shape of your hand if it had to be in a heel it will drop it down like this so that's what happening now you're actually putting more pressure for the child walking forwards there's also more pressure and because of it changing the way he's walking changing the gait pattern the child will actually slouch forward and again this will bring on later in life poor position uh, incorrect posture lower back pain etc and it, it I mean, fashion, yes, we all are slaves or victims of fashion, but uh, I strongly advise a lot of the mothers out there that's listening, don't let your daughter be a victim of fashion at such a young age because it just brings on more problems later on in life, which can be prevented, inshallah. I'm curious, you mentioned something about BEE. The BEE I know of is different to what you're probably making reference to. Can you share that with us? Unpack that a little bit, please. Yeah, when we say BEE, it's more a joke because um, you find now there's a guy who's wearing this very narrow, pointed, long type of shoes. Uh, they also know it as uh, Aladdin's type of shoe wear. So it's very tight-fitting shoe wear, which causes more pressure onto the toes and leads to more type of conditions or dermatological conditions like your corns, calluses, it forms on these areas. So with the corns and calluses, what, what is the standard treatment for corns and calluses as a result of it being inflicted by ill-fitting shoes? Uh, usually for corns and calluses, uh, when patients do consult a podiatrist, the podiatrist will skillfully uh, debride along the hard skin from the, the, the callus is made up of uh, keratin. So the layers of skin, the podiatrist will debride along it. As you can see on your screen as well, in the center, it's a corn. So what the podiatrist will do is use a, a blade and debride or take away the skin and then a nucleate or cut out that little corn that's inside there. And it's usually the corn that causes a lot of pain. So again, uh, those corns can occur on the bottom of the foot. It can also occur on the toes. And this is caused because corns and calluses can be caused for three reasons. One can be uh, incorrect or posture or the way you're walking. So there's shearing friction. The other one can be because of tight or ill-fitting footwear. And that's cramping along the toes. So because of that, there's this repetitive trauma all the time uh, on the skin, which causes the layers of skin to be deposited and becomes thicker and thicker and thicker. And that's why afterwards you see these calluses are really nice and thick. And so when you're using a blade and debriding or cutting it off, it falls away. To say it, you mentioned corns uh, at the bottom of the feet and at the top of the feet uh, and debriding it. Uh, is there a cure? Can it be removed for, you know, is there a cure for these corns or do they recur? In most times, unfortunately, these corns can reoccur. But again, it depends what is the underlying cause behind the corn. If it is because of ill-fitting footwear, then yes, by going to a podiatrist, podiatrist will sort of cut it out. But you need to try and wear a more sensible type of footwear, like broader, softer type of footwear. And if there's no more pressure, then the corn won't come back again. But if you're going to go to a podiatrist and still wear your high stilettos, pointy shoes, then the corn will always come back again. Now, those are the corns on the toes. With regard to the ones at the bottom of the foot, that, that might be caused because of shearing friction. Again, related to the way you're walking. So when we walk, we all have different patterns of walking. And this is what a podiatrist can also assess and see in gait analysis. And he'll be able to see if you are sort of rolling your foot over too much. And perhaps that's what's causing the shearing friction. And that is why you find most patients sometimes these corns and calluses come back again. Okay, it's time now for an ad break and we will return to Health Matters. Back to Dr. Sayed. Welcome back to Health Matters on behalf of the Islamic Medical Association. We have in the studio today with us Dr. Abu Bakr Sayed. Another question to you, Dr. Sayed, Dr. Sayed, who is a podiatrist in private practice. I would like to ask you about bunions. What can you tell us about bunions? Bunions, they're the worst nightmare. <laughs> uh, bunions uh, is caused, again, when the bone moves in, in the direction. So if I'm going to use my hand to try and demonstrate, because we don't have, actually have a picture of it, you find the bunions is when your big toe more, moves more towards the outer aspect of your foot. And bunions is an orthopedic problem, but commonly seen by a podiatrist. Unfortunately, bunions at the late stage, the only way it can be corrected is surgically. 
But when it's at the younger age, what we can try and do is again to try and correct the way patients walk. Because bunions are caused, uh, besides hereditary, can also be cause of uh, uh, the wrong way you're walking. For example, people who sort of excessively have flat feet, flat feet is one of the big causing factors of bunions, you'd find that when they're walking, it causes the big toe to move more towards inside, and then this causes the bone to push on the outside. So podiatrists again will assess, look at the way the patient is walking, if it is related to the gait, and the podiatrist then, then try and correct it or prevent it from getting worse, by either using a bunion splint, a night splint you do have. You also have arch supports or devices. And those type of things prevent the bunions from actually getting worse. So if you feel that you have a bunion or if your big toe looks like it's moving in the other direction, then it's the best time to go and see a podiatrist, especially if you're young, because there's something can be done besides surgery to try and correct it. So a podiatrist can manage a bunion and treat it, but if, if, if surgery is the only option, then the person will have to actually go and see uh, an orthopedic surgeon, am I correct? Yeah, 100%. Uh, in that case, yes, patients will need to go and see an orthopedic surgeon. But unfortunately, again, when a patient does have a, a bunion, it brings on a lot of other problems, like the bending of the toes. It brings on more calluses, more corns, and all these type of things, because now the architect or the shape of the foot has actually changed. Okay. Uh, just a reminder to the uh, audience out there to please call in 011-086-7701 or 203. The lines are now open. Please call in to Dr. Abu Bakr Sayed, a podiatrist in practice regarding feet problems. Dr. Sayed, uh, you mentioned during the ad break about ingrown toenails being a very common problem. Can you tell us a little bit about ingrown toenails? Ingrown toenails is when the nail actually grows into the skin and uh, if, the, if there's a slide on the, on the picture on the, uh, where we can actually look at it. So ingrown toenails, as you can see, this is a case where it's quite serious. It has a lot of pus, has infection. So what actually happens is the nail pierces into the skin. When the nail pierces into the skin, it causes this redness, swollen uh, appearance. It's very painful, so commonly people who have ingrown toenails will tell you they always have difficulty in cutting the nails. And uh, again, ingrown toenails can be caused because the nail grows larger than the nail bed itself, so it curves into the skin. Or the other reason can be ill-fitting footwear, again going back to ill-fitting footwear, or also poor or incorrect cutting of the toenails. That is why usually we advise, especially the young mothers out there, to cut the child's nails straight across. Try not to cut the nails around. Try not to cut into the corners. And the way we manage ingrown toenails can be twofold. Can be a temporary option or a permanent option. A temporary option is where we'd actually uh, gently take a blade and cut out the nail without causing too much of pain to the patient. And that's a temporary option. Or the permanent option is where we actually do a procedure where the podiatrist will infiltrate a local anesthetic to the toe, make it completely numb, and then cut out that nail spike that's growing in. Uh, it's very successful. A very common thing that the podiatrists do see in private practice is ingrowing toenails, and usually also the uh, ingrown toenails are referred to by other health professionals like your GP, etc. But always when someone has an ingrown toenail, we always advise patients don't leave it for too, la too long don't wait for last minute, don't wait, especially if you're a diabetic, don't let it become red, inflamed, swollen, because then again, being a diabetic, you're putting your foot at risk of an amputation. Regarding fungus of the feet, would that be something that you would also attend to in, in, as a podiatrist? Yeah, with regard to fungal infections, you get different types of fungal infections. You get the fungal infection of the skin itself, which commonly a podiatrist will treat and also refer to as commonly as athlete's foot. And you also get a fungal infection of the toenails, which causes the nails to become thick, discolored, breaky, flaky. So this uh, becomes difficult, number one, for the patient to cut. Number two, the patients cannot manage with it because they also become a bit painful. Some of them are not painful at all and the podiatrist does see to these type of conditions. Okay, we have a call on the line. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, brother, what is your name? Ashraf. 
Ashraf, how can Dr. Sayed help you? Dr. Sayed, I just wanted to find out what's the best advice you can give me. I've got a bad set of athlete's feet. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Steph, I'm just going to ask you a few more questions while you're talking of athlete's feet. Does your foot itch a lot? Very much. In between the toes especially. Okay. And uh, is there any odor or mal odor coming from it? Uh, no odor, but there's a very white skin. Okay. Um, firstly, you need to perhaps have should make sure that it is a fungal infection. and uh, But the symptoms are there. If it's commonly that it does itch, has a bit of an odor... Uh, if you see like a white flaky substance out there, there's over um, the counter products that you can get from the pharmacy to use it. But most importantly, sometimes patients would go to the pharmacy and just buy an over the counter product and you keep on using it. Did you use anything thus far, Brother Faisal? I have tried and nothing's been working for me. Did anything give you little relief or no relief at all? No relief at all. It just the white flaky skin keeps on staying there and keeps on itching continuously. And is it painful at all? Yeah, sometimes when I scratch it, it, it like opens the skin tears, and as soon as water touches, it burns a lot. Okay, you see, a common thing is, unfortunately, with us uh, making wuzu all the time as well, okay. we need to ensure that we dry our feet properly. Now, you find a lot of the over-the-counter products will say, apply, apply it on your foot twice daily or once a day. But by making wuzu five times a day, we wash it off. So that is why we advise patients to use it more, at least use it three times a day. Make sure that you take a towel and wipe it in between your, uh, in, in between your toes. Use also antifungal sprays in your shoes. Clean them out, disinfect your shoes and socks. Uh, because these are things that uh, always makes the fungal infection come back again. But if you have been using over-the-counter products and haven't yet had any success, I would advise you then to go and see your consult your nearest podiatrist and actually let just see if it is perhaps not something else that we must see. Okay, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I think the brother also spoke and it just touched on something else. We tend to walk barefoot and I know you said it's health. It's you uh, that it's healthy to walk with bare feet, but we have another call on the line, so we'll pick up on that a little later. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hi, I guess, Salam. Uh, Doc, I, uh, I am a old uh, person. I eat, alhamdulillah, they not as bad as they used, but the, the nails, I've been taking medication um, for nails. I'm not sure what the name is, but I, uh, time ago. Uh, but uh, my nail used ingrown, and I took those tablets. And uh, it 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 came right for a while, but a lot of hair on my from my head. My brother, <coughs> I'm gonna cut you off there. We can't hear you too clearly. You said you had something wrong with your nails, and then you took a tablet for it. Okay, there was some medication I took some while ago. I don't remember the name right. Okay, no, that's not that's not a problem. What's wrong with the nail? Can you describe the nail to us? Uh, it's uh, it's it's not straight. At least. Starting to turn, what it, what it used, what was the case? It's starting to turn inside. And is it painful? Uh, yes, it was. It was sugar. Uh, brother, I think that you, if you can call back, the line is not clear. We're not hearing what you're saying. So please call us back. We, so we'll, if you can put the phone down and call us back. Shukran. Unfortunately, we couldn't hear the brother there. Perhaps he'll call back again. The line was quite bad. Uh, going back to that question that you asked about uh, barefoot walking. Yes, as I've indicated, barefoot walking is good, but it's good for young children. It's good before the age of two years old. We do advise, uh, I mean, individuals to wear shoes and socks. And also touching on what we were talking with regard to the other uh, caller is unfortunately fungal infections, viral infections, bacterial infections, are commonly picked up in uh, communal showers, gym, swimming pools, wuzu kanas, and places like that. And that is why we always advise patients, if you have a fungal infection, try and make wuzu at home. In fact, there's a lot of sawab also for making wuzu at home and coming to the masjid. And in this way, you'll prevent also yourself from picking up these type of conditions. Assalamu alaikum. We have another call on the line. Uh, yes. Suppose, yes. Okay. 
Sister Posia, how can Dr. Sayed help you? Um, I wanted to advise him that there was a caller earlier and he said he's got a problem with toes itch a lot and gets a white skin. I wanted to tell him that if he can use a two months course of Lamisol tablet and if he uses it, he must just put two solid months and he'll see the big difference and he won't have that problem at all. Uh, gee, sister, yes, uh, perhaps Lamisil tablets is for fungal infection, that's what it is for. But I wouldn't just advise anyone just to use Lamisil tablets or any other antifungal tablets for that matter. The tablets are quite strong. They do cause side effects of headaches, nausea, vomiting, also possible uh, liver damage. So before patients at home start diagnosing and treating themselves, please just bounce it off with your medical practitioner, your GP, your podiatrist to ensure that you can take these type of tablets. Because it's commonly we find patients taking these tablets where they're trying to treat one condition and unfortunately it's causing more damage to something else. So just be a bit careful with just buying a tablet or swallowing any medication for that matter. Always consult your medical profession first. Okay. Uh, we, you mentioned something earlier, Dr. Sayed, something about referred pain to the knees when you said the arches would affect the knees and often people misdiagnose and think that the problem is, that's the source of the problem. Can you tell us a little bit more about it and how it can be treated and how one actually needs to attend to it? Okay, not all knee pain can be treated by a podiatrist, but certainly some knee pain can. And uh, if we go back to what we were discussing early on, we were discussing with regard to flat feet. So what happens is when someone has a flat foot, the arch collapses, and this causes an internal rotation of the tibia, which causes more pressure onto the knee area itself. And uh, this causes the patella to move. So you'd find commonly patients will complain of knee pain. And if it's related to the flat feet, then certainly, yes, a podiatrist can help them. But it must be diagnosed and seen properly that if it is related or it's not related. Sometimes x-rays would be uh, uh, efficient or necessary. Sometimes uh, sonars and ultrasounds would be also necessary to try and diagnose if it is related or not. So the knee can be complicated and needs to be uh, seen holistically as well. Okay, shukran. We have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you. How can we uh, help you? How can Dr. Sayed help you? Uh, now, I, I, I want to give you advice on the uh, fungus on the feet. The, the boritic powder is the best to put it in the stocks, in the shoes, rub it on the feet. What powder did you say, ma'am? Boritic powder. Bo boritic powder. Boracic powder. Yes. Yes, my husband had it, and uh, I treated his feet like that, and it cleared it completely. Okay, that's good. I mean, I'd uh, perhaps uh, do more research or do more reading up about boracic powder. Yeah, thanks that's very good. Thanks for that information. Okay, pleasure. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye. Okay, so you've got more work cut out for you. We've got people that are giving mm. you more information. You can yeah. conduct some research and explore that at greater length. And I think that's it for any medical professional. You learn every day. Every day there's something new. And I think we're never too old or too young to learn. And it's very important that we, we take this advice from patients because obviously patients have been suffering from those conditions and been trying things. So thanks for that, sister. We'll try and look up what's boracic powder, I think you said. Dr. Sayed, I mean, I, I think there are probably things that, you, you know, you haven't been asked questions on, but perhaps that you are wanting to share, things that you have seen and identified in your practice, if you'd like to share with the audience some of your experiences with your patients. I think I just want to go back to one of the calls where the lady said uh, the patient should take an antifungal tablet. Uh, I just want to talk about perhaps more about it and elaborate. Antifungal tablets are not the first choice of treatment. Uh, times have changed, there's big improvements. Nowadays in the medical industry we have laser therapy and laser therapy is a machine which converts uh, electricity into laser and self and laser is used to treat these fungal infections. So how laser actually works is that the laser beam itself will penetrate the nail, 
as it's penetrating the nail, it destroys or kills the fungi cells. And also it stimulates new nail to grow. So laser seems to be more successful. Studies have indicated that it's far more successful than topical or oral medication. And uh, laser has no pain, no side effects, no adverse effects. So it's very, very safe to use. And that is why I wouldn't just advise or patients just to listen and say, I'm going to a pharmacy and buying an over-the-counter antifungal type product because these tablets can cause more damage. And especially if you're not so sure if it is a fungal infection, always go to your seek assistance from your professional podiatrist or your GP and get some advice. So the moral of the story is always seek medical advice. We have another caller on the line. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, good slam. Uh, doctor, I called a little earlier and you couldn't hear me clearly. Is the blind any clearer now? Gee, Jazakallah, it's much okay. better now, man. Jazakallah. Uh, my, my toenails are, are a bit on the, a, a very dark, the smaller toenail and the big toenail on the left. Uh, okay. The left foot. And the right foot, the small toenail is, is dark. How long uh, has it been what dark? What can I do to avoid, avoid it from turning into a fungal, uh, maybe ingrown or... Firstly, like firstly, we got to ask, yeah. uh, how long has it been dark or in this condition? Um, I, well, the, the left foot has been, been like this here for a few years. I'm not sure how long, but a few years. See, it's always difficult uh, on air to yeah. try and see because physically we're not actually seeing the foot. But uh, things that we need to try and firstly see... Uh, uh, do, do you perhaps suffer with any other medical conditions, uh, lack of vitamins, lack of irons? Oh, no, no, Shukala, I, I, I'm not aware of any of those. You don't have any blood disorders? No, nothing like that. Because commonly we pick up these type of things where patients have blood disorders, uh, etc. You also pick it up on the nails oh. and you can see a different format of the nail. So oh. the nail itself, by looking at the nail, can tell a lot about medical conditions. Uh, for okay. example, if someone lacks vitamins. So besides the darkness, we need to actually see why is it specifically dark. Is it getting thick at all? Sorry, am I? Is it getting thick, your nail? Is it getting thick or is it just a dark color? Oh, oh yeah, no, no, it, it, has, it has thickened. So if it has thickened, and perhaps it is a fungal infection. You're saying you're looking at things okay. to prevent it from being a fungal infection. Perhaps it is yes. already a fungal infection, and that is why it is like that. So um, my advice, again, go and seek assistance. Let it be diagnosed properly that it is a fungal infection. And as we just said, there's different types of treatments that can be done for these type okay. of fungal infections, etc. Okay. So uh, seek, I'll go to a podiatrist for medical, medical help. Yeah, if it's related to this uh, nail head condition that you're speaking to, certainly yes. I would advise you uh, the best person to go and see is a podiatrist and he'll be able to assist you and guide you and give you more uh, information, etc. Okay, yes, okay. Jazakallah for that. Barakla, okay, thanks for calling back again. Jazakallah. On a lighter note, you were very gender specific. You said I contacted podiatrist and he, but it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no, perhaps that was a slip of the tongue. Uh, podiatrist, um, there's a lot of good female podiatrists out there as well. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So, uh, can we help you? Wa alaikum salam. I'd like to ask Dr. a bit more about uh, yield spurs. If he can tell us more about spurs. Spurs. Gee, spurs. Do you have a heel spur, brother? Uh, for my wife. It's for your wife. Does your wife have a heel spur? Was the x-rays done to diagnose that she has a heel spur? Well, not to see the x-ray. That's what my next question. Do you need to uh, x-ray to confirm? Very importantly, because heel pain, uh, there's over eight different type of conditions that can cause uh, heel pain. So uh, again, by seeking assistance from a podiatrist, they'll be able to diagnose and be able to rule out which type of condition it is. They would also see if you, perhaps your wife does need an x-ray or does she need some blood tests as well to be done? And that's how they diagnose if it is a heel spur uh, or also referred to as a calcaneal spur. Sometimes it might just be the plantar fascia, which is a band which inserts along the heel that's being stretched or pulled too much, and that's what's causing the pain. So uh, again, th when, when is it most painful for your wife? The first thing when she wakes up in the morning, is that the most painful time? Gee, that's the, that's the and throughout the day, does it get worse with time or does it get a bit better? It does get better, but you can uh, you know, a little bit more walk hurts again.
And has she tried anything thus far to make it better, to give some sort of relief? No, just tried the inner soles and softer soles. And, and does it help when she's wearing softer shoes? Yes. Okay. So definitely, as I said, because it, it just becomes so difficult, there's over eight conditions that can cause heel pain. So your wife definitely needs to go and visit a podiatrist and uh, see actually if it is a calcaneal spur. Calcaneal spurs, yes, and like going back to that one question you said you wanted to ask, uh, x-rays is the best way to diagnose if it actually is a calcaneal spur. And if it is uh, a calcaneal spur, going back to the reason why you called, uh, there can be three ways a podiatrist can try and manage it. Firstly, perhaps is giving some anti-inflammatory medication. Secondly, can be stretching exercises, uh, which goes with the anti-inflammatory medication. Also, they can inject cortisone into the heel, which sort of helps a bit. And also, a podiatrist will be able to make for you a device to deflect or take off pressure from the heel area. And these are ways that podiatrists can help before going for surgery. So a lot of patients don't actually need surgery for the calcaneal spur. Okay. The lines are now closed and we will take a quick ad break and return after the ad break. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've got it the, in our studio today. The guest is Dr. Abu Bakr Sayyid, a podiatrist in private practice. Dr. Sayed, uh, something that we talked about during the ad break about amputations uh, and, you know, of the foot and in, in, in patients suffering with diabetes. Yeah, unfortunately, the stats globally and throughout the world is um, of much concern. They say every 10 seconds in the world, a diabetic patient is losing their legs in amputation. And podiatrists, uh, we sort of always advise patients or tell people if you love someone and it's close to you, you'll advise him to at least visit a podiatrist once a year. And in that assessment, what a podiatrist would actually do, if we can touch on that, a podiatrist will actually um, firstly look at the blood flow, look at the circulation. Is there enough circulation coming towards the foot? They'll be able to palpate the pulses. They'll be able to use machines to see if there's a poor or decrease in circulation. Uh, they'll also test the nerves because that's another common thing that gets um, affected by um, diabetes. So when the sugar content is high in the body, a simple explanation is that the sugar feeds onto the nerves and damages the nerves. And that's what we refer to as neuropathy, when the patient cannot feel anything. So during the consultation, the podiatrist will be able to see and feel to what extent is this damage already been done. And that's when the podiatrist can try and risk the patient if it's a high risk category or low risk category. And it's because of poor circulation, it's because of not being able to feed, uh, feel properly, that diabetics always put their foot at risk. And commonly, uh, we find during the winter months, patients would burn their legs uh, because of using hot water bottles, because of using too hot water. Sometimes, even if there's a little stone in the shoe, this continues rubbing on the entire day and they cannot feel any pain. So towards the end of the day, there's a big blister. And from that blister, as we know, it becomes a wound. From that wound, it develops into a huge ulcer. And unfortunately, sometimes the foot cannot be saved and it needs to get amputated. Now, there's where podiatrists play a very, very vital role to try and prevent foot amputations globally. You also mentioned earlier to me about hammer toes. Um, and the treatment thereof. We find that that's also a common problem. And gee, hematosis is very common as well. And this is when actually you find the nails, uh, the, the, the toes bending towards this direction. Hematos also can be more problematic because of uh, ill-fitting footwear, rubbing along the skin, causing corns or calluses along it. Can also be very painful. And again, coming back to our diabetic patient, if they do have hematos, if they do have bunions, if they do have these type of foot conditions, then podiatrists would advise them or even try and get specially fitted shoes made for them to deflect pressure of these areas because being a diabetic, you want to decrease unnecessary pressure on the foot. Okay. We are coming to the end of our show. And we are coming to the end of the show, and I would just like you to quickly give three take-home messages to people out there. 
Firstly, if you are concerned about any foot conditions or if you're looking at your foot and not happy about something, then go and consult with a podiatrist. To our diabetic patients out there, please, it's essential that at least once a year you need to visit a podiatrist. And general take-home messages is every day when washing your feet, just dry in between your toes properly, apply cream to your foot like how you would to the rest of your body. Make sure you're not wearing ill-fitting or tight-fitting shoes, wear socks regularly, and keep your food smiling and keep happy and keep on going. Shukran Zalil and Dr. Sayed. Uh, I think it has been very informative and I'm sure the uh, audience has really appreciated all the input and information you have shared with them today and then the consultation that you have offered and provided so generously. Jazakum. As is customary, we would like to end with a recitation of, uh, of a, ver a verse from the Holy Quran. Well, Asri innal insana lafi khus illa ladina amanu wa milu solihati wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabar. Sadaqallahu ladin. And we would like to invite you to Health Matters next week at the same time. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.